yes, it finally happened. No More Heroes 1 and 2 on Nintendo Switch. You know what that means. In August of this year, a reliable website leaked information of No More Heroes 1 getting ported to the Nintendo Switch. Fans were anticipating, is it really coming? Will we be able to push this game mercilessly on any and all Switch owners? What about the sequel? Will the porting team not screw it all up? Is it really okay for Robin Atkin Downs, the voice of Travis, to just retweet the leak like that? Nothing came about this for a while, besides the upcoming third title getting an official delay, which pretty much everyone saw coming anyway. Then, a few months later, Nintendo surprises us with a random partner showcase event upload, not only providing new information and unobscured gameplay footage of No More Heroes 3, but Sylvia also gives us a few words of advice regarding this upcoming title. Even if you haven't played the prequels, it's awesome. But it's even more awesome if you play the prequels first. Play the prequels first? What, you expect me to dust off my Wii and find the old games for scalp prices? The first No More Heroes is getting ported to Nintendo Switch! Does it have to be like now? Ugh, I'm with you, Travis. I'm in the middle of my spooky videos for Halloween. With the delay being cemented, this is just what the doctor ordered to tide people over. And as many qualms as I have with No More Heroes 2, it's nice that Marvelous didn't forget about it, despite certain fans and their desire to disregard it entirely. This re-release was developed by Engine Software, the team responsible for the Killer7 port on Steam. A satisfying one, especially for someone who prefers shooting with keyboard and mouse controls. This is the definitive way to play the game, in my opinion. Killer7 also saw improvements such as higher frame rate and improved loading times. While Grasshopper Manufacturer doesn't appear to be directly involved in these ports, I posit that they pointed to Engine after being happy with their previous work. From now on, I'll be showing footage of the new versions on Switch. When discussing the opportunity of porting these games, some concerns were brought up, such as the dedicated motion controls for the original Wii version. While No More Heroes 2 came with an option to use the Wii's Pro Controller, No More Heroes 1 only had a single scheme, Wiimote and Nunchuck. That's even less of a concern for the Switch itself, all things considered. How did the controls end up for these ports? We'll get into that in a bit. When Travis Strikes Again, No More Heroes was released on Nintendo Switch back in January of 2019, people expressed their lack of interest in the game for multiple reasons, one of them being that they'd prefer a port of the original games in order to anticipate the prosperity of a true third entry. Well, it took them a while, but now you Switch owners got what you wanted. Come on, pay up. You gotta buy it now. It's the law. Sorry, I don't make the rules, except this one. For those who might not be aware, I adore the original No More Heroes. Directed by Suda51 back in 2007, it was this insanely charming hack and slash game that oozes with style and satisfying gameplay. It's a roller coaster of pure action and pure coziness, slashing the heads off of fools one moment, then collecting coconuts the next. Go toe to toe with armed villains and one on one standoffs, or be a gas station attendant for a bit. It can all get kind of monotonous, and it isn't exactly as cerebral as some of the more noteworthy action games, but it makes up for that in so many other ways. The visceral combat, amazing effects when splitting your enemies wide open, the incredible soundtrack by Masafumi Takata and Jun Fukuda, all in this perfect little adventure of a weeb ass otaku making ends meet in order to get laid. The story follows Travis Touchdown, who gets caught up fighting top-ranked assassins with only a beam katana at his disposal. It starts out as light-hearted as you can imagine for a violent, over-the-top game with just one thing in Travis's mind. There's only one road out of here. No turning back. Okay, how about this? If I become number one, will you do it with me? Hmm. Maybe. Maybe not. Come on, just once. But, he slowly comes to learn that this campaign of slaughter will forever change him as a man, hitting his soul harder than he could have foreseen. The story takes so many turns and has more layers than one would expect at first. That's not to say it isn't full of goofiness through and through. That's what made No More Heroes so awesome. It had a very healthy mix of drama, charm, and humor, drizzled with deep, profound writing and unique presentation. 
It's a delicious sundae that anyone can chow down on and either love it for the absolute sweetness that it is, but there's layers and hints of particular taste that leave a lasting effect in your mind that only begs for more. Even the open world, while not perfect, has its own kind of cozy and unique flavor that I'll always harp because I firmly believe it adds a lot to the experience. The sequel, while satisfying in some ways, felt considerably lacking here and there, and with Suda51 being unavailable to direct, it went just a little too hard with the goofiness, and sometimes the drama was like, oh jeez, alright, stop yelling at me. But I digress, it's still a great game all in all, and the soundtrack in particular is on a whole other level. <laughs> Both No More Heroes 1 and 2 are very much worth playing. I can go on and on about the story, the visuals, the music, everything, but I already have before in my previous analysis videos, so forget all that. For now, let's see if these new ports have what it takes to provide the definitive experience for both titles. Any new viewers, rest assured that this will be spoiler free. While I played through both games and I'm still searching through every nook and cranny for issues, I'm only showing footage of the first few stages for both games, with some other parts obscured or shortened. It's game time! On the subject of No More Heroes 1, I noticed immediately that it's based off the original Wii version, just as the man intended. Of course, it isn't identical. Engine Software's port of this game may lean more towards remaster, especially considering this is not an emulation of the original game, but rebuilt from the ground up with some quality of life changes. Some of the textures have noticeable updates, as you can see here. The original game dipped in frame rate practically all the time, but now it stays at a rock solid 60 frames for almost the entire experience, which only benefits all of its animation and visual effects. Loading screens are noticeably faster, too fast for those little star bounce mashing games. Side jobs and assassin gigs are less of a hassle if you happen to fail them as well. No longer do you need to run back to the job center to reapply, it simply puts you right back in the mission's entry point. Getting into the controls, the first game now has two options. You can separate the Joy-Cons and play it more closely to the Wii's controls, complete with motion commands for executions, clashes, and wrestling moves. From all I've played so far, it seems to misread my motions a bit more than the original Wii version. This could be due to the Switch's Joy-Cons being designed differently. I think it's more custom to tilts rather than full motion swipes, although it even detects high and low stances for when you want to build your combos. Despite popular belief, no, the original game didn't read that through the sensor bar. It actually didn't use it at all. However, it isn't a perfect recreation. For the original Wiimote, my right thumb only had to worry about a single face button, A for the slash attacks and the D-pad for dodging or camera control. Meanwhile, the B trigger for melee attacks was on my right index finger. My ape brain can comprehend this setup since it was designed for this specific controller. However, the Joy-Cons each have four face buttons. Melee is still dedicated to B, but that means slashing and melee are both on the face of the controller, making my thumb all confuzzled. Still, I think it only takes some getting used to, but you can also remedy this by going to the Switch Home menu and remapping the right trigger to read B instead, and vice versa, making it resemble the original Wiimote controls better. However, that doesn't eliminate the issue of the A button being so small this time around. The Switch Pro Controller goes for a much more traditional style. High and low slash or melee attacks are mapped to the face buttons. The motion commands just call for right stick movements, but you can use the motion controls if applicable. The game plays the same way in handheld mode as well. It even lets you shake your Switch like a madman if you want to charge that way. You crazy bastard. Speaking of handheld mode, the game still looks mighty fine undocked. Gameplay and performance is buttery smooth, so you can easily make Travis proud by gaming his games on the shitter. There are a few issues that keep it from being absolutely one-to-one -one perfect. Myself and others ran into some particular glitches or visual bugs, and I even read a player reporting an instance of the game crashing. These and any issues I mention later in the video have been brought to the attention of Engine Software. They seem to be willing to look into the matter, so here's hoping for at least some of them to be remedied. However, there was one change that they can't really do anything about. Just like the Heathen version, Heavenly Star is missing. This song is notorious for being a licensing nightmare, so much that I don't even want to play it here, just look it up on YouTube. How they even got this song to appear in the original game, I cannot imagine. No More Heroes 1 is also presented in true 16x9 widescreen, but it looks slightly off, I think. The original game's widescreen wasn't exactly 16x9, leaving some blank space on the sides. The game now just kind of stretches those sides, and it only hit me once I started making these comparison shots. 
However, it isn't nearly as egregious as someone emulating an old 16-bit game and stretching it like a bozo. Also, people posit that this is the correct aspect ratio for the game, as the original Wii pinched the visuals and made everything look a little too thin, but you be the judge. I don't think either way makes a difference in the grand scheme of things. So, No More Heroes 1 definitely checks out. Sure, there's a couple of flubs, but nothing that'll ruin the experience. This is a great opportunity for Switch players to witness Travis's first climb to the top without having to dig up or find nearly 15-year-old consoles, emulate, or settle for some hideous non-substitute. I don't care about titles or power. I just want to be number one. Then master the ways of the assassin. Here's your ticket to paradise, old man. Speaking of emulation, getting into No More Heroes 2, a nuisance to a lot of players was that the game itself was locked to 30 frames per second. Now, all of the gameplay and cutscenes are presented in silky smooth 60 frames. Good stuff, but it doesn't come without a strange issue I noticed. The coconut grabber side job is kinda messed up. A lot of the coconuts fly off the trees way too quickly for you to be able to catch them. I imagine the animation of them are tied to the frame rate. I used to do perfect runs in the original version, but now that's impossible in this current state. Although it's worth bringing up that the money system in this game is an imperative and there's multiple other lucrative side jobs in the game that you can do instead. So this isn't some horrible soft lock or anything like that. I will say that No More Heroes 2 seems to have generally less problems. Perhaps that's due in part to it being a simpler game that was reduced in scale, lacking things like the open world and various side objectives. Engine software also improved the second game's core controls a bit. In the original version of No More Heroes 2, there was no way to control the camera while you're in combat, as the D-pad was changed to being a dedicated dodge. Which was odd, because the D-pad handled both dodging and camera controls just fine in the first game. Now, the right analog stick can move the camera for both ways to play, depending on whether you're locked in to an enemy or not. Just like with the Killer7 port, Engine Software found these little methods of enhancing. While they aren't really game changers, it's a practice I'll welcome in the field of ports and remasters. In fact, I'd prefer they not be game changers because then it changed the game. It's supposed to be the same game, just, you know, HD. Err. So, in the end, these ports aren't absolutely perfect. There's a few noticeable issues which their mileage on hindrance depends on the player, I think but this is still the absolute most convenient way for a lot of people to experience these first two games as they were initially intended. Perhaps the original Wii version will never be 100% replaced, but there seems to be a ton of people that are now getting the on-hand experience of one of the greatest games I've ever played. I'm so happy to see a crazy amount of newcomers finally enjoy the original No More Heroes and perhaps understand why I'm so obsessed with these games and Suda51 as a creator. Seriously, this is such a nice and awesome surprise. It almost makes me forget about... <laughs> so, if you play through the original two titles, learn to appreciate Travis as a character, and become familiar with Suda's general library, please, get Travis Strikes again if you haven't already. And if you're new to my channel, maybe check out my analysis videos on these games. People seem to like them. I think they're alright. Okay, that's it for the people who weren't sure about getting No More Heroes on Nintendo Switch. If you haven't played the original games, go do that now. See you later. Travis, hello? The moment you step onto the field, the fight begins. If you win... Alright, now that they're gone, one last thing I feel like making a note of. This is for the people that are already familiar with No More Heroes and have been following the series for a while. Back in 2018, when gameplay for Travis Strikes Again was first unveiled, there was so much disdain within the audience. I know, I know, I'm talking about the same subject for like the fourth time on this channel, but I just wanted to express something looking back at all this. Around that time, Suda talked about how the purpose of the game was to begin rejuvenating Travis as a video game icon, to get people talking about the series again, considering it's been dormant for so long. This summoned a lot of outcries along the lines of, why don't they just port the first two games instead? That should be enough to drum up interest in a potential No More Heroes 3, which never fails to make me groan. That's what the Switch needed instead of an original game, right? After its major titles of 2017 were waning down on hype, yet more ports for people to openly mock. Imagine the half minute direct spot they dedicate that to. Take on the League of Assassins as Travis touched out of this adventure of epic proportions. Defeat some brutal bosses or mow the lawn maybe of these classic Wii games now in HD.
I like to call this the Darkstalkers initiative, in which a company hopelessly ports a game or two from a series onto modern platforms in order to barely attempt detecting public interest in a game that doesn't virtually exist, just to have it fall flat and kill the series for good. I feel like this is a very dangerous way to handle a series that was never really monumental or groundbreaking in the genre it dwells in. The general engagement and controversy behind Travis Strikes Again, combined with a ramshackle plan to develop a legitimate third entry, was something that really got people talking helping Travis reach the spotlight once again. Travis Strikes Again set up so many points of interest for its future that it helped that eluding third game seem like it's already a reality, even when we don't know what it looks like. This further excited the fans that follow all of Suda's work and the fans that primarily focus on No More Heroes. I would even say this tactic got the latter group to check out Suda's lesser known pieces, such as The Silver Case and Killer7. I know my assumptions are baseless, but I can imagine the likes of Marvelous and Grasshopper seeing plain as day that just porting the old games and depending on some sales number to determine the series' existence isn't a very good strategy, even with some flashy CGI. Of course, with No More Heroes 3 teasing us nearly two years at this point, pairing the new gameplay trailer with this reveal... When's it drop? And she... was absolutely perfect and i think the ever pouring fanfare proves that thanks for watching